liftoff. We have a liftoff. Maybe so. Welcome. My name is Tom Rolander. I'm Director of Research for the Novell uh, Desktop Systems Group. What I'd like to do is take this opportunity to provide a post-mortem of what we call the Star Trek project. My objective will be to give you an idea of the rationale behind why we did it and an uh, overview of the technical effort that we went through in doing this particular project. It was an exciting period of time and I'm hoping that this will somehow capture uh, a little bit of the detail and excitement of this particular project. Our project began uh, with a meeting between Apple and Novell on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1992. On that particular occasion, we had the first meeting between Novell and Apple. Our intention in that particular meeting from the Novell perspective was to resurrect the possibility of running the Macintosh system software on the PC. This is an effort that we'd attempted some years uh, previous on the PC with the GEM product. And at that point in time, we ran into a room of lawyers from Apple. So our intention this time was to come in and see if we could do it in a more cooperative way. Our proposal, in fact, from Novell, and that meeting included Daryl Miller, Charlie York, and myself, was to go in to Apple and propose that they license to us the include files for their toolkit so that application programs could be ported that currently use their API and uh, also possibly license the source for the finder and that would give us the ability to provide the look and feel of the Macintosh experience on the PC. Well, um, we asked them and told them that we wanted to do this and our first question was, well, if we proceed, are you going to sue us? And uh, at that point, Roger Heinen, who was the uh, lead person from Apple, said, well, he felt that there was a, a better way we could do it. In fact, we might even be able to uh, put forward an effort that would do this together. So um, our meeting at that point moved along the lines of how would we actually implement uh, a, a Macintosh product on the PC. And very early on, I don't remember who exactly coined the term. It may have been uh, Gifford Klemner or Chris De Rossi, but somebody suggested the name of Star Trek for the project. The idea being boldly going where no Macintosh had gone before. That would be Macintosh software running in the PC environment. So um, we talked about how we might do that, what would be the technical issues and the business issues of doing this particular project. After that first meeting, we had a couple more meetings where we broke up into engineering and marketing groups where we discussed how a business plan will be structured, how it will be sold, channels of distribution and so forth and also focused in on the technical aspects of the challenge of moving uh, a source base of software that was targeted for the 68,000 to the PC environment. Um, that whole effort took maybe six or seven weeks and we had several meetings over that period of time. At that point it reached uh, the status where Novell was ready to proceed and we needed Apple's go-ahead. Apple felt they needed to have permission from the board of directors to take on this kind of an aggressive project. So we didn't hear anything for about uh, another five weeks. And this is beginning from a mid-February time period in 1992. Um, eventually, and this is uh, about the first week of July, contact was made between Roger Heinen and Daryl Miller, and Apple decided to go ahead with the project. We feel that it may have been influenced by the fact that uh, yeah, during the week that Apple contacted us, uh, a uh, leak had been made in the press in the PC world about a Microsoft product called ALAR. ALAR being the movement of the Windows API onto the Macintosh. ALAR is a Apple ripening agent. It gained some notoriety in California some years ago. A kind of play on words. And uh, that, that particular week that the announcement came out, we were contacted by Hyder and decided to go ahead and proceed with the project. And the question was, how quickly can we go? Well, within one week, we had established an office in Novell facilities at the Regency Tower, directly across the street from the Intel building. So the Apple people were facing the Intel logo day and night as we uh, entered those offices. And uh, set it up with a network 
Macintosh Quadra 700s for everybody, workstation, high-end 46 PCs, um, source control and everything for uh, implementing the, the project. The project consisted of 18 members. We had, um, of the 18, there were four from Novell, 14 from Apple. We had one administrative person, Wendy Santos, on the project. We had uh, project leads on the Apple side. The initial project lead was Gifford Kalenda and was later handed off to Chris Tarasi. And myself, Tom Rolanda, was the technical lead on the Novell side. So the project proceeded. We had basically everybody in the group was actually hands-on writing code. We didn't have any overall program management. Our first day in the office together was, I believe, about July 17th. And we sat down on that day with a room of the 18 of us and started talking about how we, we would go about um, providing what our charter was, and that was the Macintosh user experience on the PC. And so we talked about what elements of system software would be required to do that and what would be the best piece of software that would enable us to demonstrate that uh, capability. We concluded very quickly that what we wanted to do is show the Finder, show the System 7 Finder running on a PC. And in fact, the Finder would then be the best demonstration of the Macintosh user experience. So with that in mind, we began to break down the pieces of software that needed to be done to accomplish that particular task. It ranged from the very low level, the hardware interface, where we would have to deal with actually putting pixels on the screen, and those would be device drivers for the graphic interface. Uh, the mouse as an input device, the keyboard. We had to have uh, facility and access to the file system. And the Macintosh file system is quite a bit different from the PC file system. Not only does it have long file names, named very differently from the 8.3 naming convention of the PC, but it also has a multi-fork file system capability, which means that you have a resource and a data fork associated with the file, and that's not present on the PC. So we would have to have a layer sitting on top of the DOS file system to enable us to emulate that file system element. Well, in the course of our <coughs> first couple of days of meetings, where we sat in a large lounge over in the Regency Tower, we parceled up the various programming tasks. And we had people that were working on uh, the various elements of the toolbox, the, the APIs, window managers, for example, menu manager, dialog manager, and so forth. Uh, we had the low-level graphics, which was QuickDraw and QuickDraw GX as we began to work with it, the file system uh, elements, and the Finder itself, porting the Finder, because we had to port a large body of C code from uh, the Macintosh environment, from different compilers over to compilers, and then, of course, executables in the PC environment. This was an exciting stage of the project and uh, began our initial efforts. Uh, I'd say probably of the 18 people, most people averaged probably 60 hours a week. And our target was to complete by November, that would give us just a period of some five months, this demonstration of the Macintosh user experience. The group was highly motivated and really intrigued with doing this. The um, uh, Apple people that we worked with from Novell had very little, if no, experience at all on the PC. So part of our early work with the uh, Apple people had to be uh, introducing them to the C colon greater than prompt in the PC environment, the tools and basically the state of affairs for development in the PC environment. So a lot of our early time was spent laying the groundwork for actually beginning our work. The part of the project I'll go into some detail in describing was the low level graphic system. Uh, one thing we discovered early on to our surprise is that the toolbox, that is the API on the Macintosh, is entirely coded in assembly language that is resonant in ROM in the current Macintoshes of today. And it's not even a clean assembly language. It's assembly language that's had numerous revisions over the history of the Macintosh beginning back in 1984. So while we had the uh, impression that there was probably uh, toolbox elements that were in C, what we found out is it was all in semi language. So early on, we had to decide whether we were going to convert semi language into C, or, as it turned out, our choice was to take the actual published APIs of the toolbox and re implement them in C. This turned out to be a tremendous amount of coding. 
uh, for the Apple people to implement window manager, menu manager, dialogue manager, etc. Quick Draw was another issue. Quick Draw is a highly optimized, low level graphic system that's used on the Macintosh, all in assembly language. The idea of rewriting Quick Draw in C was a monumental, or would have been a monumental task. What we discovered is that there was a, another version, a newer version of QuickDraw called QuickDraw GX, which was the next generation of their graphics system that was entirely implemented in C. It also had some further advantages, and that was that it was likely to be able to be um, run in monitors we might not have square pixels of a different aspect ratio, and other parts of the, the video problem might be addressed better with GX. Also, there was a prototype existing of a QuickDraw toolbox, QuickDraw API, running on top of QuickDraw GX. In other words, an emulator of QuickDraw on top of GX. We did conclude that that would not provide us with very good performance, but on the other hand, it would provide us with an element that we could port. It also would give us the opportunity in running and comparing native code on the PC running QuickDraw GX with native code running QuickDraw GX on the Macintosh. And certainly one of the things we wanted to, to do during this proof of concept was to be able to compare how these two environments would operate. Now, in terms of the actual graphics environment itself, uh, we got a hold of the QuickDraw GX source code. Now, from my experience in the PC world working with graphics, what I expected to find was a very isolated small portion of code that would actually talk to the physical hardware. Well, as we began to look at the QuickDraw GX code, it was built upon what's called a linear frame buffer access to the video. This means that you have direct access to any pixel on the screen, any part of screen memory. Well, this is of course not the case with the PC environment. The PC has grown in kind of Rube Goldberg fashion over the years, and what you have is a 64K window, a bank, that's then mapped accordingly into where you want to address the physical screen. For instance, uh, the kind of display that we were choosing to do our initial work on uh, supported a resolution of 1024 by 768 pixels. This is three quarters of a megabyte. Uh, obviously, you cannot map that into 64K worth of physical memory space that you have in the PC in what's called the real footprint, the base 640K. So what we ended up doing uh, to, to address this problem was take advantage of the fact that Super VGA, which would handle that resolution, had bank switching mechanism. Bank switching was the ability to take the 64K window uh, on the 768K of real memory and move that around so you could hit any pixel on the screen. Well, this led us to a decision early on to require a minimum of the Intel 386 processor because we chose to use the 386 processor in a mode where we could take advantage of its linear address space, its 32-bit flat space. In fact, what we did is we implemented the video as a piece of, uh, as virtual memory. So we would assign 768 kilobytes to the video memory. Then, as the application would go and poke pixels in that 768K of, of linear memory, what would happen is we would produce a page fault when a new bank was hit. The page fault logic would go into our interrupt handler. We would then talk to the device driver and do a bank switch to switch in the new bank that had the appropriate 64K piece, 64K window. We would then uh, unmap the previous one that had been mapped and continue executing. So as long as you were hitting pixels within a 64K region, we would not provide any interrupts or any banks which would be required. However, as soon as you went to a pixel outside of that 64K boundary, you would produce a page fault. We would go in with the load level device driver, map in the new bank, unmap the former bank, and continue on. We had a concern early if this would lead us to some significant performance issues. So a lot of our timing and working early on was in terms of how we could deal with performance issues. Well, we found out that there was very little performance hit in, in this kind of an access. Perhaps the best kind of timing we were able to do was to do a flood fill of the screen, take a particular color and fill the entire screen. What we had uh, been afraid we might see would be a situation where the screen would clear a little bit, 
uh, we would be hesitation as the bank switch was done, zoop, you know, and move on down the screen. Of course, what we saw was a very smooth filling of the screen. The performance of the filling of the screen was a reflection of the speed with which we could access the video RAM. Unfortunately, that ends up in the typical PC environment to be quite slow. So that was a issue that we had to deal with later. We also had to deal with the fact that there is literally a plethora of different ways that the video is, is accessed in the PC world. It ranges all the way from the 4-bit color graphics, 16 color, which is this typical VGA mode, and this is a planar memory access. So you have four separate regions of memory, one for each plane of, of, of color that you're selecting. This, unfortunately, is very unlike the way uh, 16 uh, color is accessed on the Macintosh. It's done there as packed pixels. So within one byte, you have two pixels, two four-bit pixels, defining two adjacent pixels on the screen. That was the first video, one of the videos that we had to address. We had to address Super VGA. And in the Super VGA that I mentioned earlier, which handles the high resolutions, we had the problem that there is no Super VGA standard. Everybody seems to have their own mechanism for providing the bank switching mechanism to, to move the 64K window around. There is one standard that has been gradually emerging, and that's called the VESA, V-E-S-A standard. And we wrote a driver to support that standard, as well as several of the individual Super VGA modes. Beyond that, we had the fact that a lot of uh, new video technology in the PC world was taking advantage of what were called accelerator cards. An accelerator card, you get away, get away from the problem of the low speed access to the video RAM, and you provide a set of macro functionality where you send a command to the video card, and it would perform a macro level function. Uh, a good example of this would be a filled rectangle, something you might do to clear a screen. In the clearing screen operation, typical graphical accelerators perform that operation about 30 times faster than direct video RAM access. Uh, to give you a specific number, using Super VGA in a typical uh, card like a uh, Pro Designer or a Pro Designer card, what you find there is an access, it takes about three quarters of a second to clear the entire screen. Whereas we get about 30 times faster than that using a, um, uh, a card like the Fahrenheit uh, 1280 card which has a accelerator on it, and we're able to send a single macro command. So we had to implement an interface for QuickDraw GX, which enabled us to take advantage of the accelerator functions. The fourth and last category of video is video that's just beginning to emerge now, and that video is linear frame buffer access. There were two such machines that had that. One was a released and shipping machine from Dell called the DGX50. This machine had the whole video RAM mapped into addressable space. We didn't have to use any of the bank switching. And that was the closest analogy or comparison we could get to a machine like the Quadra 700 Macintosh. Um, another machine we worked with was the compact machine, QVision, and that had a linear frame buffer. So um, we saw that that was really on the horizon and we're hoping that one thing Star Trek might accomplish would be the industry acceleration of acceptance of linear frame buffer technology so that we can take advantage of that high-speed video. So that really summarizes for you the, the different kinds of video we operated with. Um, it's difficult to go into all the details, certainly, of the different challenges that we had. Um, it was amazing in terms of how all the pieces fit together. We started with some very um, simple elements that we, we got running. For example, we started with QuickDraw GX itself and just got the primitives running on top of the graphics device drivers. And then we moved forward to get the uh, QuickDraw emulator running on top of that. And we began with a test program. That's, in fact, one of the first demonstrations I'll show here in a minute. And this test program grew as we added uh, a menu bar to it. We added dialogues. We added the ability to do uh, I I support icons and other functions on the screen. So we'll show those in a minute here when we go into the demonstration. So we'll pause here and uh, we'll start the demonstration. The demonstration you're about to see 
is going to be the first program that we ported and got running on the Macintosh, or the Macintosh software running in the Star Trek environment on the PC. Our objective here was to take advantage of the fact that people moving application software to the Power PC were going to have to clean up their applications, clean them up so that they could provide low memory access in a clean way through function calls rather than physical accesses to particular memory locations that would give information such as mouse position. Uh, also, the programs would have to be converted into an ANSI standard C format. So we hope to take advantage of that in porting software from the Macintosh to the PC. Our objective was to be able to have that op software operate from a single source base. The first application we're going to show here is launched from a batch job. The batch job begins. We hear the quadra boot sound. So we have audio facility in here. You see the Happy Mac on the screen. Then the Welcome to the Macintosh extensions off. The, the eyebrows are drawn on the screen and the application begins execution. This particular program is a, essentially a montage of, of uh, toolbox functions that we exercised and this program began with one single window and, and incremented as we added functionality. We'll show you a little bit of that functionality. This is my top window which is a copy mask icon test. We have a time and date window over here, the time and date test. We have some control testing over here <clears throat> with slider bar that we can move around, click on the small portion, the broad portion of the bar. We've got radio button, we've got check boxes, we've got dialogues that come up. Here's an OK. We'll do a cancel on that dialog. We have what we called silly balls. This was actually the first window we had uh, running on the system. Here you'll see pull down menus. And part of the performance issue, you notice that it's not as quite as quick as you would expect to see in a Macintosh. The slow performance there on things like the pull-down is the fact that we are running a QuickDraw emulator on top of QuickDraw GX. Go over to the menu bar and I'll quit this application. Next application I'm going to show is one that we obtained from one of the bulletin boards that Macintosh users can access. It's a Mandelbrot program, and it became our benchmark in terms of our ability to take an existing Macintosh application and port it to the Star Trek environment. This particular program was taken from a Macintosh bulletin board and in a Macintosh uh, source format, which would be the carriage turn delimiting each line. We were able to take that source program, download it to the PC, run our simple conversion tools, which converted it into carriage return line feed delimited lines, which is what we have on the PC environment, make any modifications we had to to the source to get it to work with the MetaWare C compiler that we were using, build the application, and then run it. That whole process took a total of about four hours to accomplish and convinced us that we, in fact, had a mechanism that would enable us to port software fairly rapidly from the Macintosh world into the PC. So we obtained our objective there. There were some things that made this easy for us. For example, there about was a dialog box. It was fairly simple to implement. Uh, there were a limited number of menus in here, uh, specifying different pen sizes. Here you'll notice the screen will fill very slowly as this uh, goes and uh, does a Mandelbrot on the screen. So this was our, our second major program that we got running. Um, one of the things that I became quite intrigued with as I looked at the Macintosh and in particular GX was a demonstration program that I saw of QuickDraw GX. In fact, I regard it as probably one of the best pieces of demonstration software I've ever seen. So one of our objectives became porting the QuickDraw GX demonstration program, something called the slideshow, to the PC. Now, before I show the slideshow, I want to show the Finder itself, because the Finder was really our benchmark of um, showing that we could present the Macintosh user experience to PC users. Again, quadra boot sound. We wanted to make it look, feel, sound like Macintosh had a smell. We wanted to make it smell like a Macintosh. So it, this uh, starts out. You bring up the system, and what you're going to see here is the actual Macintosh desktop.
we have the complete and full menu bar that you have on the Macintosh. Uh, here we have our disk icons. If we were currently logged into the network, we would see the network drives on the screen as well. We open a drive, and what it will have to do now is go down through the DOS file system and present the DOS file system as if it were a Macintosh HFS. Now, in order to do this, we ended up implementing a layer on top of DOS to provide us with the resource and data fork, the multi-fork access to a particular file. And uh, you'll see that over here. We also then can create folders which have upper and lowercase names. Um, here we see file folders and uh, files on the system. You'll notice that command.com, for example, appears here as an application. I could take something like command.com, go in and label it. Label it hot, for example, and you'll see that it's now in the color red. I could go in and create a new folder. A new folder would be created here as a directory, and it's untitled folder, the same as you have in the Macintosh. And we could go and enter a long name. It is my folder I've typed in here. And what will happen here is we have created an 8.3 name for that folder so that it can still be accessed from the DOS side, and yet we maintain this information uh, in a separate data structure so that for the purposes of the desktop we can access it and show it as the full name. But we have the facility here to be able to move the folders around on the screen, change the color, and do all the operations that you normally associate with the Macintosh. Uh, let me close this window down for a moment and show you the, uh, the sound that we had on our opening screen came from our About screen. And I'll show that now. We'll bring it up at the end of the demonstration with the camera zoomed all the way in so you can see it in some more detail. But we'll show the About screen here. This was done through a QuickTime movie that was ported to Star Trek. Liftoff! We have a liftoff! Make it so. Okay, we're going to now shut down this application, quit the finder, and show the last application we ported, and that was the Slide Master, the Quick Draw GX demo program. Sometimes uh, we found, as a result of the having things like the quadra boot sound and the look and feel on the Macintosh, we would almost momentarily get confused at times about whether we were on a Macintosh or a PC and would reach for the option key and the, you know, the Apple key and so forth. So it really was pretty compelling in terms of the actual user experience itself. Um, would you like to zoom in on this so that we uh, get this window filling the entire screen? And we'll show that in some detail here. Okay, I'm going to begin this application by putting it in an automatic mode. An automatic mode is one in which it will just step through all the slides here and give you a chance to view and get an overall perception of what we have running here. I'm also going to show this in a moment on a Quadra 700 itself so you can get a feeling for what we have moved between the two machines. Also, in this particular hardware here, I'm running a 46 at 50 megahertz, which is good news, um, and that's certainly state-of-the-art technology. Um, on the graphics side, I'm running a Fahrenheit 1280 card, which is providing for me a graphics accelerator, but unfortunately not near the performance of a linear frame buffer. That would actually be the ideal situation in which to make a comparison between the Quadra 700. When we did our benchmarks between the Dell DGX50 and the Quadra 700, we determined that the Dell DGX50 was approximately 15% faster than the Quadra 700 running the Quick Draw GX package. And there we were really comparing truly an equivalent apples and apples because we had the same source base running on the two machines. And the only discrepancies we would have in performance there would be raw CPU speed and, of course, the efficiency of the code generated by the compilers. As I've been talking here, you've seen it go through a quite elaborate demonstration of the different graphic facilities available in Quickdraw GX. It is quite an amazing graphic program and was quite satisfying to be able to port this to this environment. 
In fact, it answered one of the issues that we were bringing up in Star Trek, and that is, how can we make Star Trek compelling, in fact, even to perhaps existing Windows users? Our conclusion was that we might be able to do that by providing more facility than Windows. And QuickDraw GX, as you're witnessing here, is a significant step beyond what Windows can do today. We've got one more screen here, and then I'm going to stop this from the automatic mode and go back and show you a few of my uh, favorite screens here. We'll go back to the top level of the demonstration, and here you get a preview of all the slides. Now, it's probably difficult to see in the video, but all of these are currently animated and operating in a shrunk down form, in a minimized form on the screen. If we go into any one of these individual operations and show them operating, here for example is the polygon demonstration. And here you see the fairly slow performance when we have to go through the Dell DGX, uh, pardon me, we're going through the uh, Fahrenheit 1280 card. And that's because we're generating page faults as we draw these lines. We're only able to take advantage of accelerators for drawing horizontal lines, vertical lines, and for filled rectangles. We unfortunately were not able to use the accelerator for these lines you see drawn at an angle. And that was because of the pixelization. That would be uh, the difference in the pixels that are turned on in a diagonal line between GX and the way a hardware accelerator might draw those diagonal lines. Let's go back up here and show um, a couple more functions such as transforms. GX is quite efficient in terms of its ability to use different shaped objects for clipping. Here you see using a rectangle for clipping. Here we're using an oval for clipping. Here we're actually using a text string for clipping. So we're rotating a, a rectangle behind text and using the text to clip. On to some other demonstrations to show, um, in this case, the, the inks. Transfer mode was one that was very interesting. Here we see color, and we can move this over to darken it or lighten the color, all the way to black and white. We can change our tint over here to the blue side, green side, over to the red side, and we can adjust our brightness. Quite powerful piece of software and a very nice demonstration program. Uh, let's go back up here and a couple more of uh, illustrations showing viewports. Here we're mapping on the top a color screen into a monochrome down below. We have different screen aspect ratios and, and uh, display capabilities. And let's go back down to some of our examples. The flyby is one of my personal favorites. I'll show this again on the Quadra 700. You'll notice that you can watch it redraw here, and that's a little disconcerting as it waves by on the screen. But remember, as we get to the Quadra 700, that when we have a linear frame buffer on the PC, the same piece of software, with no change other than running a different device driver, is running 15% faster than the Quadra 700. That's the flyby. Here's a rotating dice on the screen, showing us the different uh, faces and, and the illusion here of, of 3D as they have a dot drawn above the surface. Um, the marble slide is quite fun. Here we're doing hit testing between some uh, balls that are bouncing across the screen and text you see here in the form of the word shape. So we're actually hit testing between the round objects and the text itself. Um, and uh, this is quite a remarkable demonstration. This source program for this particular slide is about 50 lines of C code. A very powerful graphic system. Another example here is the clock. Um, I'd like to have this clock compared to the Windows clock. It's uh, quite powerful in terms of its ability to uh, manipulate and deal with color. This is not done through palette shifting. This is done through the color system that's and rendering that's supported by Draw GX. So, to conclude our demonstration, I'm going to launch the Finder again, and this time we'll zoom in on the screen and give you a chance to see our um, credits, basically the About screen, and we should be able to see um, here the hopefully the names of the individuals that have worked with this project, and I'll I'll read them off as as we get to that. We have the About the Finder. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 
Star Trek, boldly going where no Mac has gone before. It has been brought to you by Dave Brown, Kifford Kalenda, Chris DeRossi, John Fitzgerald, Mark Gonzalez, Charles Haynes, Fred Huxham, Kelly King, Jane McMurray, Jeff Miller, Alan Mims, Fred Monroe, Dave Owens, Tom Rolander, Wendy Santos, Suzanne Slider, Russ Weiser, and Dean Yu. Thank you. We're going to conclude this tape with the demonstration that we promised on the Quadra 700. This will give you a feeling for the performance that we were able to obtain on a Dell DGX50 with the linear frame buffer. So you get a good feeling for that performance area. So if you'll zoom in on the window. Zoomed in, Dave? Are we zoomed? Yeah, we'll be there in just a second. Okay. Okay. Okay, and we're going to begin this, this demonstration. I'll go to the shape slide, and we'll go through and show the shapes that you were seeing. And back to the polygon. Here you can see the performance then with the, uh, with the linear frame buffer. Okay, we'll go back out to show a couple other slides. Flyby, dice, shape, and the clock. Here's the flyby slide. Now you'll notice that it updates the screen very rapidly without the f quite the same flashing that we saw on the um, on the PC running with just the graphic accelerator. Also, one other thing I didn't mention earlier, and that is that we got the uh, Star Trek running with multi-head support. We were able to run it with two screens and slide windows from one screen to the other, which was another compelling reason we felt in comparison with, with Windows capability. Go over to the dice. You can see how quickly the dice rotates now when you're in a uh, direct pixel, linear frame buffer type of environment. Here's the marbles. The hit testing. Oops, and there we'll conclude the demonstration. By the way, the GX that uh, we're showing here is in fact older than the GX that we were running on Star Trek. So we did have a few failures on that part. So it's been fun talking about this. I hope this has been an interesting experience. Goodbye.